since I plan to be here a whole life, I might as well learn. Because we don't have too much information about Southern California history. Yeah, a lot of it is by uh, oral uh, oral interviews. Now back east, they got everything, you know, the Constitution, the libraries, Tom Jefferson Library, the Library of Washington, D.C. But there's really not too much of what happened here in 1910, 1890, 1930s. I'm A bowling alley built in 1958, the Holiday Bowl exemplified part of the process of rebuilding the Los Angeles community after internment. Given the bowl's location on Crenshaw Boulevard, it was important in the desegregation of Los Angeles as it served a multicultural clientele using sport, food, and friendship. The Holiday Bowl was also prized for its googie architecture, a Southern California style. Due to a variety of factors, however, the bowl closed its doors in 2000. The Holiday Bowl was demolished in October of 2003. When the Holiday Bowl was built in the late 1950s, the Crenshaw area was heavily populated by whites, but was also a cultural and commercial center for many Japanese Americans, rivaling Los Angeles' center, Little Tokyo. At, at the time, I don't think you really, I really thought about it too much, but it was a pretty diverse neighborhood even back then. But it was, I think, it, primarily on the Asian side, as Japanese Americans and Chinese Americans probably predominated the area with the African American community and uh, the Caucasian community. My mother uh, and father bought a home on Van Ness, uh, which is uh, Van Ness and Exposition, which is one block uh, east of Arlington. Now, the reason why they had to do that, uh, and I put, let's put this in a really historical perspective, uh, there was an unwritten law that African Americans and other minorities could not live uh, west of Arlington in the 40s. And, uh, and then finally, we bought a house on Crenshaw. Uh, we bought a house on Crenshaw uh, between uh, Adams and, and Washington, right in between there, before, they, before the Santa Monica Freeway. But areas in Los Angeles at that point my average point of 65 years in the 50s and even in the 60s are pretty well uh, segregated. But that Crenshaw area was not. That's what made it so exciting, I think, because I used to drive to work along Exposition Boulevard and, and I'd see these beautiful homes, or homes with these beautiful yards that obviously, you know, the gardener, and I was thinking of the Japanese tradition of the gardener. And a neighborhood, you know, when you grow up and it's as a kid, you don't really know the difference anyway. And I do remember when, when I was in high school, at Dorsey, they're talking about Dorsey sort of being the ideal high school because the the population I think at that time was pretty evenly split in thirds in terms of Asian Americans, uh, African Americans, and Caucasians. So it was almost held up as a as a role model, if you would, for a diverse you know type of community. In December of 1957, the Los Angeles Times announced the construction of a new bowling facility at Crenshaw in Rodeo Road that briefly outlined the management of the place. Begun by Harry Oshiro, Hanko Okuda, Paul Oyamura, and Harley Kusumoto, the Holiday Bowl was financed in part by selling shares of the business in the community. Bowling, as does all sports activity, required performance. To not seek out excellence runs counter to the goals of competition and often eligibility to participate. For groups, especially those who frequented the Holiday Bowl, activities that not only allowed public achievement but acknowledged and celebrated it were important arenas for expression. As they were building the uh, Holiday Bowl, I'm more or less inspected every day, you know, see the progress and uh, uh, very anxious to uh, have it completed so I could go and bowl there. Uh, we're bowling at a different house. But uh, anyway, so we finally uh, completed it, and uh, of course, a lot of leads came in from uh, various other uh, voting areas. But uh, primarily, uh, it was uh, a niche leads that came in there. It had uh, fairly good spacing. Um, 
they had the pool room, of course, the desk and the bar. Um, they had a little playroom so that um, if you brought your children, there'd be a place for them to be while you're bowling. And they had a pro shop in there. And I just remember that it was a big deal for me because my, my father liked to bowl, and that's how I was introduced to the sport. And actually, it was sort of funny because I remember it was called the, the Mert Bowl or Crunchyroll Bowl at the time. That was the only I lived there prior to Holiday Bowl. And to tell you how far back that goes, that was a bowling alley that didn't have automatic pin setting. So there would be a guy back there that after you bowled your first ball, you'd have to clear out the, the pins and you'd have to wait till they got out of the way before you could throw your second ball. <laughs> I mean, that's when I started, that's how what I remember very distinctly that, uh, you know, that's how the sport was. And so when the Holiday Bowl opened up, it was a big deal, not only for the neighborhood, but uh, just the introduction of technology as it is at that time, as far as automatic pin setters and all that. And I remember uh, my mother, you know, uh, taking my, my brother and I uh, to the Holiday Bowl as a young child. We were going there bowling. And uh, it's the first, first time I ever went bowling in my life. You know, I was there at the Holiday Bowl. And I uh, remember eating there in the restaurant uh, as a young child. And that, of course, carried on over the years. But it was always interesting to watch all of the leagues come in there with different colored shirts, different um, logos, and their names across the back. And, and the, the seriousness with which they came in. Um, and there were certain nights for certain leagues. I mean, there was maybe a senior citizens group, and there were guys uh, that were in their like 40s or 50s. There were a lot of Japanese bowlers. Different groups would come at different times, and, and it was almost like looking at bowerware in action. I mean, you know, bowerware being all colorful, and all these shirts were different colors, turquoise and black with with, with yellow writing on them. Well, yeah, there were some good-looking guys, and most of the time they would be at the counters if they were by themselves. But there would be some cute guys, and cute guys bowling, too. Uh, Holiday Bowl had the um, capacity to attract uh, a lot of the better bowlers in the area. And if um, you want to be the best, you have to compete against the best. And I love that competition. There's a lot of uh, 200 average bowlers there. And uh, for me, that was great. That gave me a incentive to go out there. I gotta get this better, you know. I bowled every Saturday morning. They had a junior league, which is uh, something that you know I always look forward to. And uh, actually, bowled for the, the bowling alleys and junior traveling team. So we went around the city, bowling against the other bowling alleys. And you know, week to week, you go from one bowling alley to the other, you know, visiting different uh, places to, to compete. The game itself has changed a lot because years ago we used to use uh, rubber balls on wooden lanes and now it's plastic balls on synthetic lanes. You don't have to uh, really get into the true basics of bowling. Now I see guys out there that um, on good old wooden lanes uh, they'd average maybe 160. They're carrying 200 averages now. So um, in the old days, a uh, guy that carried a 200 average, he was somebody. Now, <laughs> you're just another bowler. <laughs> well, my mother was a waitress at, the, at Holiday Bowl for wow. 19 years wow. in the coffee shop. This is Clara Harris. <laughs> and you started working there in 72 uh, until your retirement in 91. Uh, graveyard shift until they close that, so from 12 at night till 8 in the morning. Usually when I tell people that, they say, oh, then I probably saw her there. Uh, because so many people would come in after hours when none of the other restaurants or that served in good food were open. With my mother working the graveyard shift, and I would visit her you know, sometimes at different points during her shift, uh, it, it, there were very different, distinct crowds that came through at those throughout the those hours. So uh, in the late evening, there were the, the people that were finishing up their league bowling. So they were, you know, working class people or middle class folks that, that were there for the leagues and they'd come over afterwards to have a bite to eat and socialize. Then around 2.30 or so, the bar crowd came in because all the bars closed at 2, so they had to have somewhere to go. So, so, they, so she'd get the bar rush uh, in the middle of the night. 
And then um, early in the morning, around 5 o'clock or so, the, the people the, who were getting ready to go off to work would come by for their coffee and a light breakfast uh, in the early morning time. And there were regulars from each one of those different camps that uh, uh, really reflected the diversity of the area. The Trisha Boulevard was really, um, you know, the in, the in place, you know, it was, it was the street. Uh, there were really quite a few nightclubs there. And you would go out to, uh, to clubs and party and I guess have a few drinks. A lot of people would be hungry. Instead of going home, we would um, get together and uh, we'd go to, um, to eat there. The different clubs would close down and so on. At 2.30 in the morning, that place would be, there wouldn't be a seat. It would be standing room only, everybody uh, getting something to eat before they got home. And, it was almost like a meeting place after you left the meeting place, you know. Um, but it was good. For business appointments and things, I said, hey, let's, let's meet in Bowl, let's meet at the restaurant. I mean, it was just, there was just no question about it, where, uh, uh, where we would go to meet. It was, it was a meeting place. It was also a um, comfort zone, too, because we knew it was right there in the community. You know, it, was, it wasn't too far from home, you know, so it was, it was comfortable to go there too. When I go out on dates, uh, I, I, I take, uh, take my girlfriend to the Holiday Bowl. When you talk about it, I always thought it was very unusual because it had Chinese food, Japanese food, and American food. And it really, in that sense, also reflect the community that it served. They had everything, everything. And my, I couldn't believe that this was a place where I would get um, I would ask for a bowl of rice to go with whatever I was ordering, and the bowl, I, I didn't understand how did they make the rice into a ball, because it was always served in a nice little neat bowl, and the bowl, the ball of rice sat like a snowball in the middle of the bowl. And one of the main um, attractions there as far as the dish was the, um, the rice with the gravy with your breakfast, um, which is really, I think, for some people, it's really a southern uh, specialty. But you know, have your sausage, your bacon, and you would have your know, hash browns. You would have your eggs and biscuits, of course, or toast. And it was really a, a really hustle bustle type of restaurant. And plus, you know, the um, you, it, there was a view. They had this wonderful eclectic menu. I was pretty conservative and just usually had my omelet or my eggs, but. You know, you'd go in there and you felt like, gee, this is such a wonderful mix of people. I could have chili and rice for dinner. The chili and rice was very popular there. And, uh, and then they, had, they also opened a sushi tempura bar adjacent to the coffee shop, which is, like, again, an unusual kind of thing in a bowling alley coffee shop. It was just wonderful to go into the bowl and to see, uh, uh, you know, African Americans and and Latinos and Asians all sitting at that sushi bar. That's where I first had my first sushi. It's sort of funny, what I remember is, is going in there and, and buying uh, french fries to go and dumping a bunch of uh, ketchup and, and salt in the bag and just shaking it up and going out. And it's Cherry Cooks. From its onset, the Holiday Bowl generated social capital. It included a nursery in its initial plans, attending to the family needs of its bowlers. In the 1960s, the Holiday Bowl held fundraising drives to find a cure for cancer and sickle cell anemia to programs with the Martin Luther King Therapeutic Recreation Center that helped autistic children through bowling in the late 1990s. We had kids who, they'd be fixated on the same lanes over and over again. Dealing with kids with disability, they like consistency, you know, some sort of structure. For them to have the end lanes one weekend and then be stuck in the middle, it was confusing them to learn how to bowl. It, it was just a, most confusing thing Holiday Bowl actually did. They let us have the lanes that we needed. I mean, they were completely accommodated to our program and to the kids with disabilities. I mean, every resource they had was, I mean, it's just like they rolled out the red carpet for us. The great thing that was so wonderful about the Holiday Bowl is that uh, it went through, you know, went through so much. You know, I, I, I remember uh, the, uh, uh, during the first riot, in 1965, the Watch Riot, or the Watch Rebellion. Um, I remember uh, going down Crenshaw, and uh, there were tanks, actual tanks, going down Crenshaw. Now that 
it left an impression. I mean, my, my family's business was practically burned out and, and they weren't able to, to function for quite a few months uh, afterwards. And so, you know, there, there were times when things uh, were rough along those lines. It set this community back, I would say, 20 years or more because um, there has been no real revitalization from what I can see having moved back here. Because people started moving away, eventually the, um, I don't know if they, you know, I'll, I'll, I'd say they, it was white flight, I guess you would call it. We were a lot of factory workers in the 60s, the 70s, Goodyear and Firestone. You had Bethlehem Steel. When those jobs went overseas, um, the blue collars, uh, bowlers, lessened. Talking about why uh, the the, the uh, graveyard shift closed up, and I wasn't even aware of that story. Oh, because of the gangs. The gangs had <laughs> taken over the parking lot and uh, used that park to entertain themselves. So they had to close it. Uh, bowling alley. There was a rough crowd coming in there for a lot of years before it got so bad that they ended up closing the graveyard shift because I remember you coming home at least on one occasion when a bullet came through the front window and you told me about it and I, uh, you didn't seem very flustered by it but I was kind of concerned about it. In 1992 we had another rebellion. Our, our campaign offices were right on Crenshaw, not far from the, from the bowl. And so the campaign staff uh, would stay in the would stay in the campaign headquarters while all the rioting was going on, and buildings started burning. But it's something that I noticed that the um, uh, that there were there were there were people who were standing in front of the bowl while other buildings were being were being burnt around the bowl. Um, that they were standing there and it was like they were and come to find out later on they were protecting it these were patrons these were people who um who enjoyed the bowl who enjoyed eating there in the restaurant and, uh and they uh and they were willing to risk harm you know to go out there and save this you know this wonderful beautiful facility that meant so much to the community i remember you know when we had the civil unrest that a lot of businesses were on fire and I remember driving down Crenshaw and thinking, oh my God, you know, what's happening? And I felt like all hope was gone, you know, that's how I felt too at the time. Like, um, you know, I felt that very devastated by it. And so, um, I did notice that in the, in the latter years that uh, uh, the restaurant wasn't as crowded. Uh, all the lanes weren't being used. And, you know, I kind of like looked around and everything and, you know, and it wasn't, you know, wasn't the same. You know, there were families there, you know, with their children and couples and just, you know, single people. But that, but that blustery, that, that, um, you know, the, the, the waitresses going from table to table, the, you can hear the dishes clashing, you know, the people eating, you know, and, you know, you know, you know it, that wasn't happening anymore. You know, you just didn't hear that. The Holiday Bowl is one of many bowling alleys to be destroyed in Los Angeles in the last decade. One aficionado notes that over 90 bowling alleys have closed their doors in the greater Southern California area since 1976. Of these, nearly 26 occurred within the last five years. This was already, you know, talks were already taking place, but of course you couldn't really know anything. You'd learn and people would say, oh no, it's not closing, it's not closing, and of course we'd know well, we think it's closing, we're pretty sure it's closing, we know it's not closing, until finally one day they said, well, it's closing Saturday, and this is like a Wednesday, so you had a few days notice. You know, I thought they were just remodeling, but they they were actually just you know getting ready to um, close it down, and it was really sad. It was it was really a sad time, I think, for a lot of people, and for the people that worked there, because there had been people there that worked there for years, you know, that were um, you know a steadfast um, part of the um, uh, of the of the bowl of the holiday bowl itself. And cameras were down there, and it was on, you know, LA Times and you know, 
uh, the New York Times did a piece and local stations and so forth. Uh, and then it closed. And this is where this is where this whole kind of effort really took off. Though the city does list the Holiday Bowl as one of its historic cultural monuments and has retained the Holiday Bowl's facade and coffee shop for a Starbucks, a banner conflictingly advertises a for-lease announcement as well as the future arrival of a Walgreens drugstore and a Denny's restaurant to the former site. Across the street from the former Holiday Bowl is a Savon drugstore and there is a Rite Aid in the next block. While the Holiday Bowl may no longer exist in a physical sense, it lives on in two fictional pieces. Lisa Loomer's 1999 play, Broken Hearts, a BH Mystery, and Nina Revoir's 2003 novel, Southland. Each text treats the Holiday Bowl as a familial space and present-day protagonists must travel to it and back in time to stabilize the present in order to recover a moment when Los Angeles was full of cooperation and promise in the midst of chaos and outside oppression. It would be an understatement to observe that the communities frequenting the Holiday Bowl and the larger Crenshaw community itself underwent change. Yet, in the midst of such change, the Holiday Bowl and its outlying Crenshaw community reappear in historical memory as a constant. And in that constancy, there lies comfort and stability. And uh, so, to me, you know, it just felt like home, you know, very comfortable there. Uh, and uh, naturally, if I've been the Holiday Bowl all my life, half my life time, and if I went into another bowling alley, naturally I would feel very strange here. Uh, whether it's a good bowling alley or not, I would still feel uh, like a stranger and feel strange. But at Holiday Bowl, like I said, it's like home. So walk in there like, like I own the place. You know, for me, I was just really sad. And unfortunately, you know, it had to close. And then uh, now that, you know, now they're going to um, um, build, a, I guess, a little mini mall there. And uh, so it's, it's just really sad because I had so many fond memories, uh, you know, going to, the, going to the Holiday Bowl, having meetings, taking dates there, you know, eating my first sushi. Going to Holiday Bowl was a peaceful place. It was my little spot where I could sit in the window and watch traffic or watch people going up and down Crenshaw, but I could also be a part of the family of people that came and went. It was my place to, to be exactly who I was with no questions asked, you know, and I always get that ball of rice in my round bowl, you know, it was so uh, predictable and so consistent. Well, it was, um almost like losing your family home, you know, um, you got a place to live, but it's a house, it's not a home. Um, Holiday Bowl was our family home, and there's a lot of people uh, that feel the same way, you know, um, uh, the ones that participated in different meetings and so on. Um, people that didn't even bowl, they would just come there to mingle or to eat. Um, and it's hard to lose that type of relationship because you don't get it back. There's nowhere to go to get it. I don't even like to go past there now because it stirs too many uh, memories and I know that's a part of my life that will never be repeated. It, it was something something about the, uh, about the Holiday Bowl that, uh, uh, that I think when you walk through that door, I guess you, you just left all your uh, all your prejudices, you know, all your feelings about, uh, in the, you know, uh, about different races, police, uh, the world, everything. Uh, I think that they left, the, left that outside. They were in there to come in and have a good time. Come in there to, uh, to go bowling or come in and have a good meal or, uh, or to sit down with friends and family. Uh, so as the world was turning upside down, not at the Holiday Bowl, things, things went on very, very well. Very well.